Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Valde Teberisha, and I manage the AgriFin webinar series on agricultural finance here at the World Bank. Um, as you may already know, the AgriFin webinar series is a monthly event featuring lessons on agricultural finance from practitioners around the world. Today's webinar features lessons from Root Capital. Uh, Root Capital is a nonprofit social investment fund that lends capital, provides uh, financial training, and strengthens market linkages for small and growing agricultural businesses in Africa and Latin America. We have two speakers today, Nate Shafran, Senior Vice President for Global Lending, and Asya Troychansky, uh, Senior Impact Officer, both um, with Root Capital. I have asked Nate and Asya to share with all of us Root Capital's agricultural lending business model uh, with a focus on what banks and other financial um, institutions can learn from it. Um, Nate will start us off by providing a background of Root Capital, including its agricultural lending model. Uh, we will have an opportunity to learn about Root's approach to identifying clients, assessing risk, uh, monitoring loans, and finally, um, uh, he will explain the repayment arrangements to ensure high repayment rates. Um, in addition, Asya will follow with a detailed overview of uh, Root's financial, social, and environmental due diligence in order to manage risk, ensure sustainability of Root's lending operations, and improve farmer outcomes. Um, we will start with our speaker's presentation, which will take about uh, 30 minutes. Um, and this will be followed by a Q&A session with the speakers uh, for about 20 minutes. Um, I would like to say, however, that you don't have to wait until the end to ask your questions. Um, I encourage you to write your questions during the presentation in the chat box or the Q&A box located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, unfortunately, because these events tend to attract large numbers of attendees, we cannot allow the use of microphones among participants. Uh, so I, I would really appreciate, um, I, I thank you for, for your understanding and I appreciate if you, if you uh, type in your questions uh, throughout the event. Um, I will do my best to collect and, and ask all questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and we will end the webinar um, as we usually do um, within the hour. So uh, that will be at 10 a.m. Easter Daylight Time. So thank you again. Uh, thanks to our speakers. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nate to start his presentation. Thank you very much, Valdete. And thanks to everyone who's joined us this morning. You know, Root Capital has benefited a lot from the research of AgriFin and from this webinar series in particular. Uh, we've joined a number of these, and we're really pleased to be able to contribute some of our own learning. So my name is Nate Schaffron, and I oversee originations for our global lending portfolio. I'll be joined by my colleague, Asya Trojkansky, who leads our impact assessment work. Both of us are speaking to you today from our head office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Although uh, I want to point out that Root Capital has offices in, uh, in the field in four countries in which we have hub offices and country reps in, in a number of others. Most of our staff are based in the countries where our borrowers are active. For today's webinar, I'll start with an overview of Root Capital and our agricultural lending model. From there, I'll describe a bit about what our portfolio looks like and explain how we're trying to address some of the perennial challenges of rural and agricultural finance. I also want to share a bit our perspective on technical assistance and why, for the businesses that we try to work with, we think capacity building is just as important as access to credit. And then Asya will discuss a little bit our process for social and environmental due diligence, how we collect data on prospective borrowers, why we collect it, and what we see within different segments of our portfolio. First, a bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with Root Capital. We're a 15-year-old United States-based specialized agricultural lender with a team of around 150 people in 25 countries. Importantly, at Root Capital, we think of ourselves as an impact-first lender. And I'll explain more what we mean by that and how we operationalize it. But I often get the question, what impact investing 
really means. It's a term that has become current in the United States and increasingly other countries. There's not a single right answer to what impact investing is, but for us at Root Capital, it means that the investor sets out, first of all, to address a defined social need. In our case, rural poverty alleviation. And then secondarily, to achieve the best possible financial return while doing so. This type of lending requires a rigorous analysis of both the potential social and environmental impacts of loans under consideration and the actual social outputs from the businesses that we finance. With this as our mission, we make loans into small and medium-sized agricultural businesses in Latin America and Africa. Many of those are cooperatives or producer organizations, but about half are private agri-SMEs, agri-processors, estate farms with agro schemes, etc. These businesses often experience great difficulty accessing adequate credit from the commercial banking sector. They're in what we call the missing middle of agricultural finance. Too big for a microfinance lender, but still seen as too risky, too remote, or simply too agricultural for most commercial banks. Uh, the Initiative for Smallholder Finance, uh, a, a development organization that spun out of Dahlberg Consulting, estimates that the unmet need for finance by smallholders in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and South and Southeast Asia, excluding China, is $280 billion. That's the problem we are trying to solve, and that's why, in addition to our direct lending, which, as root capital, really only reaches less than 0.1% of global demand, we're committed to working with others, many of you who are on the phone, to catalyze a global market for smallholder finance. Serving the financial needs of this rural agri-SME sector requires some flexibility, and I'll get into our approach shortly. But first, for those who are wondering how we're structured and capitalized, uh, I'd like to give a bit of background on that. We are a nonprofit, non-bank financial institution. We fund ourselves by raising private debt from institutional and individual investors through a notes program. We currently have about 120 million of debt under management with around 200 investors. And those investors earn a return of around 2.5% on their notes with us. Depends a bit on seniority and tenor, and, and we have a mix of those. Our investor base includes government entities like the US Overseas Private Investment Corporation, multilateral development banks like the IFC, major foundations like the Ford Foundation and the Gates Foundation, corporations involved in agricultural value chains like Starbucks and General Mills, and then increasingly uh, individual investors and socially responsible investment funds, money managers who are looking to place a portion of their investments in impact-first vehicles. We on-lend on that capital to eligible businesses in the form of short-term loans for working capital or seasonal trade credit, and increasingly, long-term loans for capital expenditures in machinery and equipment, or for investments in on-farm productivity. Since we were established in 1999, we've dispersed about $970 million in total, and have managed to maintain a cumulative repayment rate from borrowers of 97%. Interest and fee revenue from those loans covers the majority, but by no means all, of the costs associated with our lending. So in our core portfolio, earned revenue covers about 80% of our costs in a given year. As a nonprofit NBFI, we rely on philanthropic capital to cover the remaining 20%, as well as to build up our net assets so that we can, in turn, raise more debt and grow our balance sheet. We also raise grants which cover our advisory services and impact assessment, which Asya and I will talk more about later. But one thing I'd like to say to this audience, because I know that there are a lot of different types of lenders on this call, is that Root Capital's financial structure is by no means a perfect indicator for the economics of your institution serving this market. For the larger financial institutions among you, uh, you should understand that our largest clients do provide a positive financial return. Um, a kind of rough benchmark would be $500,000 and above, being a, a ticket size that is profitable to serve. But for smaller local lenders, 
say, rural savings and credit co-ops or second-tier banks in emerging market countries that have their own rural branch network, you might be well positioned to develop a cluster of small angry SMEs, say, in the ten dollars to $50,000 range, applying a simplified underwriting process and lowering the cost to serve from what root as an international lender experiences. So where do we find our clients? We generally find businesses in three ways. First, direct inquiries from businesses themselves through word of mouth and website and some advertising. Second, and perhaps most successfully, referrals from value chain actors like buyers, certifiers, other lenders, and TA providers. And then through active business development. Uh, that's a job that in, at one point was the responsibility of our loan officers, but we've now put together a, a small dedicated team focused on networking to generate new credit opportunities. I should add that while Root Capital doesn't provide direct financing to farmers, instead lending through producer organizations and SMEs, many of our clients do on-lend to their affiliated farmer suppliers through some type of an internal credit fund. So it's through those businesses, those smallholder aggregators, that we're able to reach over a million smallholder farmers every year. Okay, so let me go briefly into the mechanics of how our lending works. As I said, our specialty is agriculture. So the structure of our loans takes into account the unique realities of smallholder agriculture, first with flexible repayment schedules designed around our clients' harvest and production cycles. This is one of the primary obstacles for agri-SMEs accessing commercial credit, the fact that most loan products are structured with regular monthly, bi-monthly, or more frequent payments. Uh, the business is depending on cash flows from agricultural harvest cycles are unable to meet. Today, roughly half of our portfolio is focused on coffee, and we continue to diversify in other value chains like cocoa, tree nuts, cotton, dairy, sorghum, maize, rice. We offer a range of credit products, from short-term trade credit to long-term loans, most recently going up to seven years for capital expenditures and for renovation of tree crops on farm. And there's actually an AgriFin webinar next week on the subject of tree crop renovation that I'm looking forward to. Uh, about 70% of our lending, though, is short-term, so working capital for a single agricultural season, whether for production, inputs, or uh, for crop purchase and export. For that latter type of loan, for crop purchase finance, we typically lend by discounting purchase orders, taking as security an assignment of the proceeds from those orders. So for example, if a coffee cooperative has a contract to supply a buyer with, say, five containers of coffee, we'll finance 60 or up to 70% of the value of that contract providing the cooperative with the upfront capital they need to purchase coffee from members, process it, bulk, ship, and ultimately fulfill uh, their, their contracts for export. At the time of loan closing, the cooperative, as the counterparty to the loan, assigns all the payments due under the sales contracts to Root Capital, and we're then paid directly by the buyer when the product is shipped or delivered. After deducting principal and interest payments, we remit the balance directly to the client. That's our uh, contract discounting triangulation model, and today roughly half of our loans are repaid that way. Securing those cash flows allows us to require a lower collateral coverage ratio than would otherwise be the case. In some instances, we're able to lend against purchase contracts without requiring any form of hard asset collateral, though we often supplement the contract assignment with a lien on inventory and receivables to control the assets that we've financed. Now, of course, this purchase order discounting mechanism doesn't typically work for our longer-term lending, which still require fixed asset collateral or liens on land facilities. In most cases, though, though, we're able to secure ourselves against the asset that we're financing, particularly if it's movable machinery and equipment. By financing 80% of the purchase value, uh, we, on day one, have around a 1.2 coverage ratio. For the most part, our cash flow lending model is not actually terribly innovative. We know that. What is pioneering, in my view, and why the subject of this webinar is agricultural finance at the frontier, 
is where we're doing this and with what types of businesses. So true to our mission, Root Capital is committed to operating on the frontier of agricultural markets where risks and operating costs are often highest. We began as an organization lending in the western highlands of Guatemala, where in 1999 we originated our first loan, just $73,000, to a 650-member organic cardamom and coffee cooperative. Since then, we financed more than 600 other businesses. Before working with Root Capital, many of those businesses were unable to access external financing at all. They often have no credit history, minimal assets, particularly if they are producer organizations, and somewhat thin trading margins. And in some cases, again, often with the producer organizations and co-ops, are undercapitalized relative to traditional um, leverage ratios and, and may have challenges, particularly for those that are the most rural, around attracting qualified professional management staff. The other, another challenge is the fact that these are very remote businesses, often confronted with uh, difficulties around infrastructure, <clears throat> and just reaching these clients can be a challenge. We're willing to travel long distances uh, in somewhat difficult conditions because that's our mission, but it may not be the norm uh, for a commercial bank uh, for whom clients typically show up at the branch. So getting out uh, into rural areas and being prepared to visit clients uh, even if it's uh, outside of the area that the bank might typically travel to, I think is important. So let me explain a few of the ways that we're addressing these challenges and trying to overcome the high costs and relatively higher risks of frontier agricultural lending. First, as many of you who are involved in this know, the pure economics of this type of lending can be difficult, as I've said earlier. So we address this in two different ways. The first is by having access to a blend of capital from donors, public agencies, and private investors. Our balance sheet incorporates philanthropic contributions, below market capital, market rate capital, guarantees, um, and in some cases, subordinated debt. On top of all that, um, we in some cases are able to raise philanthropic support for targeted first loss capital around particular risks as we've done in the past for, say, lending in Ebola affected countries. Uh, we've also secured partial loan guarantees, importantly from USAID's Development Credit Authority, who I really recommend to any of you who are considering working with them. Uh, those guarantees we don't require to do our ordinary business, but they have been helpful uh, to enable us to expand into new markets like Haiti or to get into new value chains. The second way that we address the high cost of frontier lending is through an internal cross-subsidization model in which a portion of profitable loans generate enough revenue for us to then cover the cost of financing earlier stage or higher risk businesses that are typically costlier to serve. Cross-subsidization is, is typical of a lot of social enterprises who have a mission mandate to reach smaller, poorer, more marginalized clients, even though they wouldn't typically be attractive uh, on a purely commercial basis. So for example, um, we made recently a $50,000 working capital loan to an early stage business in Uganda. The revenue from that loan only covers a portion of the costs that we incur in underwriting it. Um, but that company has the potential to grow uh, and may in the future become a business that it is profitable for us and subsidizes other early stage businesses. And that's something we see pretty consistently across our portfolio, where businesses that have product, that have demand, um, but are starved for capital, can take off quite quickly in the first couple of years once they're able to access uh, debt. We recognize that this model of raising blended finance and cross-subsidizing within our portfolio doesn't necessarily make sense to most commercial banks. And that's why we and other impact investors exist, to operate at the pre-commercial end of the market, to de-risk a pipeline of enterprises that are borrowing for the first time, 
and to accompany their growth until commercial financial institutions are able to serve them. Now, beyond finding ways to address the high cost of agricultural lending through blended capital structures and internal cross-subsidy, we all know that there are significant risks to, risks to manage, especially given the increasing uncertainties that come with agricultural production. Our credit risk process combines aspects of the detailed risk assessment undertaken in corporate lending uh, with the types of character-based assessment common in microenterprise micro lending. Through our underwriting process, we assess the credit risk of potential borrowers using an internal rating system we've developed over time that weighs various indicators of risk across four broad categories, which include uh, one, scale and diversification, two, enterprise strength and growth potential, three, financial flexibility, and four, financial strategy. And, and I'll just say that while we don't have the weights here, uh, our credit scoring tool is weighted particularly towards this fourth section and the financial ratios. And that's just something that we've learned over time, um, that by doing hit backward looking portfolio level performance analysis, we've been able to identify particular financial ratios, the three that you see here, um, that have historically been most correlated with credit performance. Uh, in, in our portfolio. So another way that we can partially mitigate risk is by combining our capital with technical assistance. Root Capital's advisory services team helps build client capacity in many ways, including by supporting our clients with agronomic practices and most recently with mobile technology. But the core of what we offer our clients is training in financial management through our financial advisory services program. We know that securing a loan doesn't help if an agricultural SME doesn't have the people or the systems to responsibly manage that credit. In fact, credit in those circumstances can create more problems than it alleviates. So we combine our capital with tailored training for non-financial and financial managers on a variety of areas of financial management, including how to develop a cash budget, how to design and manage an internal credit fund, um, and how to transition from pen and paper bookkeeping to digitized accounting software. So this slide here shows our four-step process from an initial diagnostic of our clients starting financial capabilities to co-developing a work plan, which both our consultants and the client will sign off on, providing training, and evaluating their progress on these financial fundamentals. Some of the common deficiencies we see in prospective borrowers include overall limited financial literacy, particularly for the entrepreneur owners of the businesses, um, a lack of financial analysis. It's typical that many of our clients produce financial statements once a year for uh, filing purposes, but don't refer to them on an ongoing basis internally to make management decisions. Uh, we often see a reliance on highly informal accounting systems, uh, which means that clients are not really able to understand their own cost structure or break-even prices, something that we help them to determine. And we also often see a lack of internal controls, uh, which is always a concern for a lender. To help enterprises overcome those challenges, our team last year delivered training to 319 businesses, more than the actual number of businesses we lend to averaging eight days per enterprise per year. The training is delivered in either group workshops where we bring a number of our clients in similar industries together, particularly where there are common uh, problems, or longer on-site engagements for things like setting up accounting systems. The costs of that activity are primarily covered through philanthropy, although in some cases, buyers in the value chain are willing to pay for their suppliers to go through training because it makes them a better supplier. And we also do ask that more mature businesses contribute something to training costs, and particularly for repeat trainings. For all of our loans, regardless of the risk profile of the business, we believe there needs to be a clear impact rationale for why we expect the loan to have a positive outcome for farmers, families, laborers, and the environment. So to talk more about that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Asya. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Valdete and the Agrofine team for giving Root Capital a chance to share this morning. Um, and today I'm going to pick up where Nate left off, and I'm going to speak about our approach to social and environmental data collection, which has two main components, the metrics that we collect in social and environmental due diligence, and the deep dive studies that we conduct with a small subset of our clients. With each of these, I'll touch on why we collect this data, how we collect it, and share what we're learning. So with due diligence, what are we solving for? I would say it's three things. The first is that we are seeking to identify mission-aligned agricultural businesses with likely positive social or environmental impact. And we find that this impact could manifest in different ways. The business might be paying higher prices to smallholders, or some businesses provide agronomic trainings to farmers in order to raise yields and promote environmental sustainability. The second thing we're solving for is risk mitigation. Due diligence serves as a negative screen on poor environmental practices like degradation of high conservation value land or improper treatment of wastewater. And it's also a negative screen on poor social practices like failing to provide personal protective equipment and ensuring worker safety. The third thing that we're solving for, and this relates to the mechanics of due diligence, is to have a right size due diligence system that is deep enough to verify mission alignment but doesn't go so far as to be an audit, which wouldn't be cost effective for us as we serve um, a portfolio of 300 clients. So how does the due diligence work? The first thing to note is that the social and environmental due diligence is integrated with our financial due diligence process. It is conducted by our loan officers who are based in the regions where our clients are. With each client, the loan officer conducts a site visit annually. On this visit, the loan officer gets to know the management team, observes operations, meets and interacts with producers and employees, and verifies social and environmental practices. The loan officers then consolidate this information and record it in standardized social and environmental scorecards, which they then submit as part of the credit memo. As part of this review process, a member of our small impact team also reviews these social and environmental scorecards. And for the few cases under 5%, when the social and environmental due diligence surfaces risks, this happens with several high risk industries or if something comes up during the site visit. If this happens, we have a protocol in place and a separate pool of grant funding, which we use to engage a third party to conduct additional review before the loan moves forward. So you might be asking, how do loan officers as finance professionals know what to look for in terms of social and environmental risk? And there's three pieces to this. The first is that many of our loan officers have previous experience in agriculture. The second is that we also conduct annual social and environmental due diligence trainings in each of the regions we work in. And the third is that we've developed industry-specific guides that our loan officers consult as resources. What is in the scorecards? As I alluded to, we include metrics that help us to create a quote-unquote impact profile of the business. And this is basically to understand a business's potential impact. So you'll see in this slide the categories of uh, metrics in our scorecards. <clears throat> and these categories are root capital's potential impact on the business and clients' potential impacts on farmers, communities, and the environment. And this is proxied by the different services that the business is providing to farmers and employees. You'll see those in the right column. Please note that the environmental scorecard goes further and also zeroes in on the environmental practices of the business itself, especially if the business is doing agro-processing, and also the environmental practices that aggregators promote among their supplier base. So while you're taking a second to scan the metrics, I also want to note that developing these metrics has been an iterative process for us. The first version of the scorecard came out in 2007, and since then, we've been updating it annually in response to the feedback that we get from loan officers 
and also to reflect and respond to a changing portfolio, which as Nate explained has evolved from predominantly coffee cooperatives to a diverse mix of business types and crops with different potential risks and impacts. Two other quick notes before I move on to the deep dive. The first is I'm happy to say that these scorecards are available on our website. I believe, yes, this slide includes a link. Uh, and after the presentation, Baldete will um, feature a link on the, on the website so you can access these. The other quick note is to invite folks on the call, um, especially if you're representing a lending institution interested in learning more about our social environmental due diligence, if it's relevant for you, to so please feel free to contact us. We'd, we'd love to engage on this with you. So now I'm going to transition to talking about the deep dives. And again, the question, what are we solving for with these studies? The first thing is that these studies help us to connect the dots between the practices we ask about in the scorecards and likely impacts on farmers, communities, and the environment. I'll give you an example. The scorecards ask whether and to what extent businesses offer agronomic training. What the studies can then do is show whether this training is paying off. They can show whether there's a correlation between training participation and farmers adopting better agricultural practices or farmers improving yields. The second thing the studies accomplish is to document the socioeconomic reality on the ground. And this is important for a root capital and a practitioner audience to consider how we can improve our services. It's also important for a donor and investor audience to connect more with the work they're supporting by investing in root capital. And the third thing is to add value for clients, for the borrowers, so that they can use the study findings to learn and improve their business operations and their social and environmental performance. So how do these studies work? Again, we do these studies not with all of our clients, but with about 5 to 10 percent. The studies are a mixed method. They include farmer and employee surveys, guided interviews with enterprise management and boards in the case of cooperatives, and focus groups on select topics. What you're seeing in the slide is an example from Guatemala of the methods of data collection that we used in one study and the corresponding sample sizes. What have we learned from these studies? We've actually done over 20 studies now in the past few years in Latin America and Africa with over 3,000 farmer and employee surveys. I won't share all the findings, just a small subset. One of the things is that we've corroborated the poverty level and vulnerability of the communities we work in. We found, for example, that farmers in our African portfolio tend to live below $2.50, this is USD, per day, and many are below $1.25 a day. We've learned from farmers by asking them what they value most from a business, what makes a, what makes a client high impact from their perspective. And what they tend to tell us is that they appreciate that these businesses link them to international markets so that they don't have to sell to the intermediary uh, on the street for the, the spot price, which can be low. Um, many of these businesses provide premium pricing and they also appreciate the agronomic training and the credit that many of these businesses offer. And we've heard from business management and boards what clients value most from root capital. And what they tell us is that they appreciate that we're often the first lender to them when they're just establishing themselves. We're willing to take a risk. We're empathetic and, and flexible with our collateral requirements. And these studies are also actually available on our website. And yes, the link is also on that slide. So zooming out and to close, I want to share what we've gained from the social environmental data collection. And I'm pleased to share that it's actually more than we thought we would gain. We've met the original goals we set out for due diligence and impact studies. You'll see those in the, um, in the first column. And we've also in the process realized that there are other positive benefits from our social and environmental data collection. The first is that we've gleaned from this data inputs for refining how we place our capital so that to maximize the social and environmental impact of our lending. As Nate explained earlier, the lending we do to earlier stage clients can be transformatively impactful, but in many cases it's not net profitable to root. 
For the 20% of our lending costs not covered by earned revenue, we either have to raise philanthropic funding or cross-subsidize using proceeds from larger loans. How can we make sure that this money is well spent, or in other words, that these loans achieve exceptional social and environmental impact? And this is where the social environmental data can be quite useful. In the past year, we've been using this data to develop an impact score that allows us to compare potential impact across all loans. Now, we're using this impact score to set a hurdle rate for impact so that clients that we lose money on would have to achieve a certain impact score for us to lend to them. And then finally, the bottom right box, another way we're using this data is towards what we're calling continuous improvement to identify needs and opportunities to deepen partnerships with clients and to further their impact on communities and the environment. And I'll give two examples in a moment, but just to frame, I want to say that we see both an impact and a business case to partnering with clients beyond our core lending and training. The business case is to help businesses to grow, to source more product, and to increase their loan amounts so that the revenues generated on the loans help to cross-subsidize loans to those earlier stage clients. The impact case is to help businesses address barriers they face to continue growing and amplifying their social environmental impact. So here come the two examples. The first is related to agronomic training. We've learned through our due diligence and studies that agricultural businesses can be powerful last mile providers of agronomic trainings to boost yields and promote environmental sustainability. However, many of these businesses lack the resources and the knowledge to provide effective training. So, with these findings, we've decided to explore our role in supporting clients' capacity as agronomic training, excuse me, as agronomic trainers. And one of the things we're doing for clients seeking long-term funding to help producers renovate their coffee farms, with these clients, we're assessing clients' agronomic plans for the producers. And if we see gaps, we introduce these clients to agronomic experts to help make their plans stronger. The second example is related to gender inclusion. Under our Women in Agriculture initiative, which we launched in 2012 to maximize impacts for women across the value chain, we've made gender a core focus of our deep dive studies. And based on everything we're learning about the barriers that women are up against and the opportunities they have, we're exploring how we can partner with clients to further opportunities for women. For example, in our financial management training, where about 30% of the attendees are women, we're working with the global team to figure out how to increase the number of women who attend. And so two of the concrete things we're doing are targeting women explicitly in the written invitations that go out to the businesses, and we're also paying for on-site childcare to allow mothers to participate. So I will stop there. Thank you again very much for the opportunity to share, and Nate and I are delighted to answer your questions. Thanks, Valdete. Thank you, Atya, and thank you, Nate, uh, for a great presentation. So I have several questions that have come in from participants. I'll um, also invite other participants to um, keep writing their questions um, throughout this uh, Q&A session, and I'll, I'll do my best to ask all of them. Um, so I will start with the first question that came in, and this has to do um, with basically the role of group capital vis-a-vis uh, -vis other commercial lenders. Um, and the question, uh, I know Nate uh, talked about the sources of, of capital and, and how root capital um, raises, um, raises capital to, to um, enable its operations. Um, and one of, the, one of the sources was, um, you know, philanthropic um, sources. So the question is, does the use of blended capital provided at a low market rate tend to crowd out commercial lenders. Um, given that we, we understand that this, um, you know, commercial lenders in many cases uh, may not uh, be interested in, in serving this segment of, of lenders for now, but the question is, will they ever get interested 
um, if they were competing against um, subsidized credit? Yep. That's an entirely fair question. So a couple of things about that. First of all, we, we agree with that, with, with the point that it would be detrimental in the long run for the development of a of a agricultural finance sector if uh, impact capital were underpricing uh, commercial banks locally on loans that they would otherwise choose to do. So we, we don't do that in a couple, a couple of ways. First of all, we generally price to market, so we're not offering clients uh, credit cheaper than they could access it. Um, we, we lend in U.S. dollars at a rate that is typically in line with the local um, U.S. dollar rates of, of 9 to 14 percent. Um, and in local currency, we, we simply price based off of uh, a spread over the T-bill in that country that gets us to the same rates as commercial banks. We want borrowers to be able to manage commercial credit, to develop a, a credit history and track record with us that they can take to a commercial bank. And that doesn't work, obviously, if they're dependent on subsidized credit. And the second thing, really importantly, is that we won't lend to a business if they have a, a good local commercial alternative. Um, we, we won't take out existing credit, and if they have an, an option from a local bank, we prefer that they take that option. But we, what, what our mission is, is to serve businesses that aren't being served, to meet their needs, and then ideally over time, build them up to the point that they're able to access uh, bank financing. Great. So, just to follow up, uh, so w for example, when you when you identify clients, you have something in place that asks them whether they already have access to uh, commercial bank lending. Or That's right. It's one of the questions in our questionnaire. Um, okay. ha have you attempted to access commercial bank financing, and what was the outcome? And uh, in our, our impact scorecard, it's actually the thing to which we give the highest uh, point score. So there's, there's a, a range of things that we give a score to, um, impact in terms of rising incomes, impact in terms of, of avoided ecological damage. Uh, we give points for reaching uh, marginalized communities such as women and indigenous people. Uh, but, but by far the largest point score is for additionality. And that's the concept that we're making a loan that they're unable to get that no other lender would provide. Uh, and that the weighing uh, of that through our point score in the impact uh, assessment tool uh, means that we, we really only direct our subsidy towards those businesses that need it. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, so there was another follow-up question uh, regarding, you know, it's very closely related to this, and I think I can summarize it by, um, by just uh, asking, so, what do you think is the, the advantage of, prov of providing this subsidy to root capital rather than directly to commercial lenders? Uh, the, the question here is that the, the commercial lenders have the same need for subsidy to enter into this market segment and in, mo in uh, most ways are better positioned to serve this segment over the longer term once they figure out how to do it profitably. Um, and and then there is an example that is cited uh, by the participant here. It says the pay for performance approach being tried in Ghana has yielded 75 million of additional agricultural finance issued by commercial lenders for a subsidy of over two million dollars. Is this not an attractive model? So I guess it's it's a matter of why why should these subsidies um, be directed towards group capital and not commercial lenders. What is the advantage of that? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think that we would say that subsidies shouldn't be directed towards any other lenders. That sounds like a, an outstanding example. And I think the point that we're trying to make is not that, 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 that our model is unique, but rather that there is a need for blended capital in, in this segment of the market in reaching some older farmers. And, and I think that there, as I pointed out, the need is so large, $280 billion. Um, that it, there's no one bank, there's no one institution, and there's no one model um, that can and will absorb uh, enough capital to meet it, right? I mean, we, we all need to be in this, uh, in this sector. We all need to be serving agricultural enterprises. Um, and, you know, we're certainly uh, the first to celebrate 
other good models and encourage them. And that was partly why we wanted to share our approach to blended capital. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Nate. Uh, so the next question um, has to do with uh, with uh, the the share of your lending that goes to copy farmers, and um, it says that uh, I uh, there's 50. You mentioned that there's 50 percent of the root capital lending goes to copy farmers, uh, and this is already a well developed value chain. Um, do you plan to diversify into more local food crops? Yeah, absolutely, and, and we are doing. Um, so it, it wasn't as well developed a value chain 15 years ago when we started doing this work. Um, we were among the only lenders that were addressing uh, the needs of small-scale coffee cooperatives, and we're fortunate to have built up a successful track record and, and a significant book of renewal clients um, that we support there. And, and so that... 50% includes a lot of the borrowers that we've been with for a number of years, and many of them are now also accessing commercial bank financing in addition to root capital. Um, but yes, we have absolutely placed a focus on diversification, and so we're in over 30 other value chains. Um, and we have my personal focus over the last five years has been trying to get us into um, value chains for food crops in Africa and Latin America, and, and we're doing that. We've raised a, a portfolio of capital for that purpose. Um, what, cert what is true is that those value chains are, are what we term loose value chains most of the time. Um, you don't have as much integration of smallholders into an organized trading system for, you know, say, maize, rice, sorghum uh, locally as you do in things like coffee and cocoa globally. And there's a real need for that, and I'd really encourage anybody here who's a donor or is working along the value chain to partner with uh, local domestic large off-takers, those food staples, in seeing how they can replicate the success of the coffee industry in incorporating smallholder suppliers more directly. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess the next question is it's uh, related directly with uh, with the lending process and. Um, it's um, when root capital takes liens on its collateral and on accounts receivables. Does it actually file these liens, and if so, where? Yeah, we do, um, and we're working in a variety of countries, so whatever the appropriate collateral registry is in that country, but yes, uh, routinely. Um, I, I think one of the things that we do to provide a, fle a little flexibility to the clients is to provide an initial over advance at the start of the season. Uh, a pure kind of warehouse receding finance where you're only lending to the business um, on the basis of inventory in the warehouse typically doesn't work for co-ops that don't have uh, the capital to begin the season themselves. And so we're very often, um, we'll provide an over advance uh, that's unsecured to begin the season and, and then file uh, an inventory lien. And as the client begins to purchase uh, over time, um, that actual advance becomes secured against inventory and we're simply refinancing what they have in the warehouse. Great. So um, the, there are several questions coming from participants in uh, different countries in Asia and uh, they all uh, are asking whether you have any operations in, in Asia, in any like India or Pakistan, or do you plan to, to expand uh, into that region as well? Yeah, it's a good question. So we recently began lending in Indonesia, um, a, a country that has over 18 million smallholder farmers living below the poverty line. Uh, it's a, a major producer of most tropical commodities, value chains that we know well. Um, and crucially, uh, it permits cross-border lending by NBFIs. Uh, we'd be interested in India. The, the challenge has been so far um, regulatory constraints against uh, cross-border lending by non-resident financial institutions. Great. So I think the next question um, pertains to uh, the second part of the presentation that uh, Asia gets, um, and it, it has to do with the environmental impact. Uh, the participant is asking what metrics is root capital tracking for environmental impact? Um, is it water, chemical fertilizer use, uh, soil quality, and if root capital is uh, financing any organic 
Great. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. So we're asking about all of those, um, all of the categories that the, um, uh, that, the, that the person asking the question mentioned. Um, we're asking both about the business's own practice and how it's managing its agro-processing, um, how it's managing solid and, and liquid waste, for example, and also the practices that it's promoting among smallholders related to water use, related to soil management, um, agrochemical use, biodiversity. And um, to the second question, we are financing organic farmers. Of the businesses that we finance, about 60% have a sustainability certification. So this includes organic, um, fair trade, rainforest alliance, OOTS. We also finance conventional value chains. Um, and an important note here is that all of our businesses have to pass through our environmental screen, environmental due diligence. So both the ones that have that are organic and have sustainability certifications and that are conventional, for all of our clients that pass our screen, we feel good about their environmental sustainability practices. Great, thank you. Um, so going back to the um, to root capital lending. Um, model, uh, one of the question is, what is the share of non-performing assets in your portfolio? I think you mentioned earlier uh, that uh, you had a repayment rate of 97%, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, cumulatively, um, last year our provisioning expense for the year was 5.6%. That had ticked up from 47 the previous year, and it's higher than uh, is our target. Much of that was related actually to the previous question about moving out of the value chains that we have the most history and expertise in. So it is true that as we've moved from uh, coffee and cocoa into a variety of other value chains, and in particular into domestic food value chains, um, their, the credit performance has not been as good. We think that that will change as we gain expertise, but it's also true that those are, as I was discussing, looser value chains, and, and there are more risks around distribution, counterparty risk, um, and, and not just the contract fulfillment risk that we face in our uh, export finance. Great. Thank you. So we're, we're approaching the end of um, the, the webinar, actually, but there's a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is that, that just came in, so I'm just going to read it out um, and hopefully we can answer it. In the actual um, social and financial context, do you consider a new financial model for agriculture will be more open for small farms with non-banking institutions or commercial banks? I'm not sure if, uh, if that's a clear... Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing I'll say about this is, is, and getting back to this point about there being a need for lots of different models and actors, um, there, one interesting trend has been a, a number of asset leasing companies starting up in Africa. So you have uh, a rent to own in Zambia, you have equity for Tanzania and Tanzania, and a lot of these are dedicated, uh, and in Nigeria you have, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but they bill themselves as Uber for tractors. Uh, but the idea is uh, is to provide local small farms with the asset finance that they might need, not the, the fifty to fifty thousand to a million dollar loans that we're providing, but but the ten thousand twenty thousand dollar loans that are needed for a tractor or a chaff cutter, et cetera, um, whether in term whether in the form of credit or or an actual asset lease. Great. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Asya. I think uh, we've come to the end of the webinar, um, and I don't see any other questions coming in at this point, but I just wanted to say that we also just launched uh, the Agriculture Finance Group on LinkedIn, and I invite anyone who would like to, to join and continue the discussion on the group, uh, you're welcome to do so. That's actually one of the reasons why, why we launched this group is to facilitate post-event and post-webinar discussions on various topics. So, um, but more broadly, also just to facilitate knowledge exchange uh, among our members. I'm going to post the, the link to the uh, LinkedIn group 
uh, in the chat box, and you're welcome to click on it and join the group, and and then maybe post additional questions or comments on um, on on the group. Um, so I I just want to thank Nate and Asya for for great presentation and for taking the time to um, to share their knowledge uh, with us. Um, as always, we, we do record the webinars and we make the recording available on our website. After the webinar, uh, within the next 24 hours, I'll, I'll send the email to all participants, um, which will include the recording and the PowerPoint presentation for, for you to refer to at a later time if you would like to do so. Um, so I also uh, would like to ask everyone to take a very brief survey. Uh, we do this usually at the end of each event uh, to to get your opinion about uh, what you what you thought about the event uh, and about the presentation and how how we can improve. So the the survey should be opening up. Um, it's actually open now. So I would appreciate if you can take just a few seconds to fill that out. Um, and um, I also wanted to let you know, and, and Nate mentioned this during his webinar, that we uh, we have uh, another webinar coming up next week on April 5th uh, with Rabo International Advisory Services. Um, and we've invited uh, Elise uh, Fonders, uh, who is a senior project manager with RIAS, to discuss lessons from a recent study on successful renovation and rehabilitation schemes for smallholder coffee, uh, Coca and Paul oil, oil uh, farmers. So um, I'm going to post the link as well uh, to that webinar in case um, you're interested to join us. Um, the, the link will appear shortly on the chat. Um, so with that, um, we will, on behalf of the entire Agrofin team, I just want to, wanted to thank Nate and Asia for presenting and to thank everyone for, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again um, in our future webinars. So thank you. Thank you all.